A man in dark sunglasses, wearing an expensive black suit and carrying a fine Italian suitcase, strode purposefully towards me. I could smell the Givenchy cologne radiating off of him before he reached me. The sun shone directly in my eyes as I stared at him, wondering where this would lead. Hello, soldier, he said, shaking my hand with an iron grip. I saw his freshly cut hair and the slight bulge under his shoulder where he kept his pistol. The thought came rushing into my head. Unbidden. Looks like a fad. Good afternoon, sir, I said, saluting him briskly. He swatted away the gesture. You don't need to do that, he said. In fact, you may be done saluting and polishing boots forever, soldier. I have a potential job offer for you if we could speak in private. What's your name? I asked. Agent Stryker, he said. And I already know yours, Sergeant Toads. I looked into his mirrored shades, wondering what hid behind them. I have a job for you, a real god-honest career. You could be done with the Marines today if you wanted. He looked over to the administrative building, the clear glass doors opening and closing as people came and went. He looked back at me, putting his hand on my shoulder in a fatherly way. So, will you listen? Yes, sir, I said. And we walked into the admin building. The blast of cold air conditioning feeling like a drink of water after wandering around the desert all day. He found a small unoccupied office marked conference room and motioned me inside, closing the door behind us. I sat down in the small, poorly padded chair on one side of the wooden desk, and he took the large, leather one across from me. From my vantage point, I could still see outside. Marines passed back and forth on their way to whatever duties they needed to carry out, and support personnel came and went from the admin building and the medical ward across the street. They reminded me of ants constantly rushing forwards for the good of the hive. From far away, the lines of soldiers even looked like ants. So, Agent Stryker began slowly. Sergeant Jintao Toads, we finally meet, he said my name slowly as of tasting its syllables, pondering what it could mean. You certainly are an adept soldier. You graduated in the top 5% of your class from boot camp, and your IQ test shows that you're in the top 1% of the American population. You have a bachelor's degree from UConn and also graduated at the top of your class there. Moreover, you have joined South Korean and American citizenship. I nodded at this unsurprised. This was a man who did his research. You speak fluent Korean. Yes, I said nodding. I speak Korean and English. I grew up with both of them. Oh great, he said, clapping his hands together excitedly. You are exactly what we need. I'm recruiting from the CIA and we need someone experienced and competent. Somebody who speaks the language and understands the culture. Would this mission fit you, soldier? What do you think? Uh, I don't know, I said truthfully. It felt like this entire encounter had come out of nowhere. It had an unreal quality to it. I couldn't believe the CIA actually had interest in me. You won't be alone, he said quickly. We have another more experienced agent who would accompany you. I just stayed quiet. He pulled out a contract showing me a paragraph marked with a handwritten star. This is a one-time offer, Sergeant Toads. Either you sign now or you will never see us again. He pointed at the marked paragraph. I grabbed the contract, spinning it around and quickly reading it. The section that he had marked discussed compensation. 70k a year plus hazard pay as well as potential bonuses for dangerous assignments. This was far more than my salary as a sergeant for the Marines, which was laughably small. Okay, fine, I'm in, I said smiling slightly. I shakily rose from my seat and he did the same, extending his hand. We shook and suddenly the future seemed bright, exciting, even limitless. I had 18 months of training after that and then assumed the title of Agent Toads and Operations Officer for the company. 
My new partner, a gruff man with a thick southern accent, didn't speak much or reveal anything about his past. For my first assignment, I was told to go to a small office on the topmost floor of the building. I walked in, seeing a man standing there next to a desk, a file in hand. I looked him up and down, seeing a muscular gym rat with blue eyes, a tan complexion and very dark hair. He didn't smile. His stony face, just observing, seemingly seeing everything. In his black suit, standing six foot three, he made an imposing figure. I am Agent Toad, sir, I said, stepping forward to shake his hand. He quickly looked away, pretending to not notice it, and I put it down. Yeah, I know who you are, he said, and cut the sir crap. My name is Agent Hudson, or Mark. Since we'll probably be killing people together, I assume we should start on a first name basis, right? Jin Tao. A slight smile crossed his lips, a smile that didn't reach his cold and blue eyes. He had the eyes of an executioner. A shiver ran down my spine and I felt suddenly glad that this man was on my side. This here is our first assignment. Oh, it should be easy for a young hotshot like you. He pushed the folder into my chest hard. I grabbed it and he started walking out of the room. Where do we meet? I asked. He didn't even turn his head. At 6 a.m. a car will be sent to your apartment. After that, uh, maybe we'll meet in hell, I don't know. He laughed at his own joke, slamming the door behind him. I pulled the rolling chair back from the desk, putting the folder down. First, I went to the break room and made myself a cup of green tea, using lots of Geokuro leaves from Japan. Carrying the cup back to the office room, the fragrant steam rising from the cup, I thought of all the possibilities in that folder. It could be a mission to go to the rainforests of Central America, or the jungles of Cambodia, or the vast forests of Siberia. I opened the first page, my heart beating fast in my chest. I read through the preliminary report quickly, feeling a sense of disappointment. We were to go to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, more commonly called North Korea. The order said Mark and I would travel to a biological and chemical weapons facility near the Chinese border, find out as much information as we could, and travel back to the rendezvous point. It was fairly short on details from there, and I figured that I would find out more when the time came. I went back home, eating a big meal and getting some sleep setting my alarm early so that I could shower and shave before the CIA car whisked me away, bringing me to new and exciting places. I dreamed that night of endless tundras and open oceans, and forests filled with wonder. The car showed up at exactly 6am. I saw Agent Hudson sitting in the passenger seat, an older man probably in his 60s sat behind the wheel. I had never seen him before, so I got in the back seat. The smell of cologne and air freshener filled the car, a pleasant combination like vanilla and flowers. I looked at the older man in the rearview mirror. He smiled at me, his dark eyes meeting mine. He stared at me for a long moment. Agent Stryker recruited you, huh? He asked, more of a statement than a question. I nodded. He's a good man, that Stryker. He recruited me too all those years ago. My name's Al, by the way. I'm semi-retired, but I still drive for the company. He said using the informal name for the CIA. A lot of people who worked for it simply called it the company or the agency, assuming everybody would know exactly what agency they meant. It's nice to meet you, Al, I said, feeling tired. I had taken a caffeine pill and some ginseng supplements just before I left, but the combination hadn't kicked in yet. And I looked up at Mark, who stared out the passenger side window, not speaking. Is this your first time in the DPRK? Al asked. I nodded. Boy, some crazy stuff goes down in that country. My dad was in the Korean War. Have you ever heard of Gwishin? I had heard the term, but I didn't really know anything about it. And no, I grew up in the USA, but I speak Korean. My family taught it to me, but I don't really know the urban legends, I said. His eyes narrowed as he drove down the highway towards the military airport. This is no urban legend, he said cryptically. The Gwishin is real. 
My dad actually saw one when he was on guard duty. Said that he was alone in the watchtower, their company had taken heavy losses. He usually had two people on guard duty, but until reinforcements arrived, he had to do it alone. He mostly just chain smoked cigarettes and drank coffee, he said. Nothing ever really happened. And then one night something finally did, and it was in North Korea behind it. He said that he saw women walking out of the trees, each of them in a white funeral gown. They had stringy black hair covering their faces and he couldn't see their eyes. He didn't even know how they saw to move forward. Their hair went all the way down past their chest and they seemed well. Strange and human even. He called out in broken Korean, telling them that this was a military outpost and that they needed to turn around immediately. They just kept on walking, going faster and faster now, their movements jerky and unnatural. He knew something was wrong and he called for backup, but turned off the safety on his gun and started to aim. He called out again, telling them that he would be forced to fire if they didn't stop immediately. They started running towards the guard tower then, a dozen of them, and as they ran, the wind blew the hair back from their faces. He saw that they had skulls beneath, grinning, bloody skulls with pieces of rotted flesh still hanging off. They were barefoot and he saw the bones in their feet from where the skin and muscle had worn away. It was eerie how they jerked and limped at such superhuman speeds, he said. So he opened fire, but they had reached the ladder of the guard tower. He shot a few, but they just kept on coming, twisting their bodies unnaturally, dark blood staining their white gowns a black color. You could see straight through some of them where the bullets had torn through their arms or legs, but they seemed to feel no pain. He started to pray and he saw rotted pale hands reaching up from the ladder to the guard tower. So without thinking, he jumped. A fairly long fall, he said, but he rolled and only ended up breaking three fingers in his arm and spraining his ankle. In immense pain, he tried to run as fast as he could and then the reinforcements had arrived. By the time they got to the tower, they found only trails of dark, clotted blood and some stringy black hair still on the deck, right where my father had been. He stopped talking, taking the exit to the airport. The silence in the car seemed deafening. He pulled up to the gate, showing his identification. The security guard let the gate rise and radioed something from his post. Soon we were pulling up to the jet and Al was waving goodbye to Agent Hudson and me. Good luck, new blood, he said to me. And remember, my story was in some campfire make-believe. There actually are things in those woods and in that country that aren't normal. And with all their biological and chemical weapons research, it may be much, much worse now. And with that, he put his window up, turning the car around and driving away. A blur of black trim and squealing tires shining under the hot summer sun. On the flight over to China, Agent Hudson and I discussed the plan. We would sneak in through the relatively porous Chinese-North Korean border at the exact time when the guards were being changed. We had about a five minute window where the departing guard would brief the arriving guard in the station watchtower before coming back out. Moreover, we would be armed with various weapons, in addition to the Glock 30 that I always carried in my shoulder holster under my suit. On the plane, we had two Heckler and Coach HK416 rifles equipped with both fully automatic and semi-automatic switches. We had pre-filled magazines with Dum Dum special bullets that would expand upon impact and create catastrophic tissue injuries in any enemies that we encountered. In addition, we had grenades, lots of round, blue M67s that would fragment and explode across an area 40 feet wide. And we had two very small guns with special needles filled with a torfin, a quick-acting opioid usually used to sedate elephants or large mammals that would instantly put down any normal human. We also had opioid antagonists so that the person wouldn't stop breathing after receiving it. If we found any North Korean scientists or high-ranking officials and we thought that we could take them out alive, we were supposed to try using the tranquilizer gun, though this was a secondary priority. If we could get them close to the border, then a few auxiliary agents would be in place to grab the hostage from us. The North Korean border guard could be killed if the hostage was deemed valuable enough. 
This was all off the books, and if we were captured and tortured, the US would immediately deny any involvement or knowledge, and say that we were lone wolves or mercenaries. Before we knew it, we were landing in China, in an airfield surrounded by lush trees. A Chinese driver who didn't speak a lick of English was there waiting. He took off quickly. I looked back at the sleek metal jet, wondering if I would ever see it again. He dropped us off seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on a deserted, dirt road with deep potholes and large stones scattered all over. Next to us, a thick, dark green forest loomed, rising up into the mountains that stood like watching giants overhead. I knew somewhere in that mountain range the border between China and North Korea stood, and then our mission and the killing would begin. Though this happened two months ago, I still remember the eerie sensation that crawled over me then, as if my intuition knew of the horrors that I would encounter that day. We had changed into camouflage suits before leaving the plane. The patches on the cloth, shades of black green and dark green were designed to match the flora in this region. Without hesitation, Agent Hudson began to tramp off into the woods, leaving the dirt trail behind. We didn't talk on the walk. He checked an electronic compass in his pocket, seemingly adept at reading the bizarre constantly changing numbers on the screen. He would occasionally stop behind a tree, pull out the electronic compass, and then slightly change paths again. Soon I saw a small clearing with a watchtower up ahead. Looking to my left and right from our vantage point high in the mountains, I saw more watchtowers peeking up from the North Korean terrain. They went on as far as the eye could see, spaced out in the thick forest, their tops rising above the trees like snakeheads rising out of a pit. This here is the crossing point, he whispered. Be ready for anything. I nodded grimly and we walked forward. I took out my binoculars and I saw the shape of a man on top of the tower. I was about to motion to Agent Hudson but he had already seen it. He peered through his binoculars frowning. Should we cross if there's still somebody up there? I asked. I thought this was supposed to be the changing of the guard. He looked at me strangely. Look again, he whispered. I took out my binoculars and really inspected the figure, though in the dying light of the day it was hard to make out details, but after five or six seconds I had seen and realized enough. The man wearing a North Korean military uniform had been crucified against the watchtower, his eyes cut out and his skin peeled off. Someone must have skinned him alive and then put the uniform back on his body. We walked forward slowly, our rifles raised. Soon we reached the watchtower and found no one around it. We walked slowly up the stairs, making as little noise as possible, expecting an ambush. I came to the top of the tower and found the man's corpse, with thick nails driven through his wrists and ankles. He hung from the wall around the topmost room of the tower, his head drooping. I saw letters written behind him in Korean, thick lines of black paint. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. That'll be the book of Revelation, Agent Hudson started to say when the corpse twisted violently and inhaled. The muscles on his skinned body writhed as it pulled against the nails, sending thick gouts of blood streaming down from his body. Snapping its teeth, its lipless mouth opening and closing with loud clacking sounds, it tried to lunge at me. Instinctively, I backed away, but the nails driven deep into the thick wood had kept the corpse attached. Oh God, I whispered, pulling out my pistol and pointing it at the head of the writhing body. No, Agent Hudson said, his voice fierce and commanding. Don't you fire any guns unless necessary. The sound could draw attention. It could draw the whole dang North Korean military. Just leave it there. We have a mission after all. My head seemed to clear and I put the pistol away. We walked back into the tower and started descending the stairs, the corpse still gnashing and snapping its teeth at the air as we left. Our plan was to go straight to the biological weapons laboratory after moving through the Chinese North Korean border. But our plans went quickly awry when dozens of North Korean soldiers ran by in their brownish-gray uniforms. We were coming out of the watchtower and thankfully we were far higher up in the mountains than these soldiers, winding their way up the dirt road below. 
They only had one car and the rest tried to run next to it. The car billowed out black smoke and gave the entire surrounding area a smell of burning and sulfur. All the soldiers that I could see were extremely thin with the sunken eyes and prominent cheekbones. They looked like they hadn't seen a good meal in years and since this was North Korea they probably hadn't. But they still were armed and far outnumbered us. We were supposed to use stealth to complete the mission, not raw force. A North Korean informant had given us the code to enter the biological weapons facility, and we would be entering at the slowest time of the day, when the fewest staff members were present. We would still have to kill any guards that we encountered, however. Change of plans, Agent Hudson said, pointing to a deer trail that wound in the opposite direction of the approaching North Korean troops. There's a small border town nearby where we can hide temporarily, until the military clears off the road. There's no other way? I asked. He shrugged. Uh, not that I know of, he said. Our planned route follows that road. We could lay low for a couple of hours and then come back and check out the area. Try not to be seen by any civilians, though. They're all spies for the regime. These people turn in their own neighbors for an extra bowl of rice. Heck, half of them are eating snakes and rats and grass just to survive. And they probably earn a thousand a year at most. They would bring us right to the torture chamber if they caught sight of us. Yeah, I figured, I said. So are we just not going to talk about what we saw back there? Agent Hudson stopped suddenly giving me a severe look. His blue eyes looked me up and down coldly. Okay, then talk about it, he said. The statement caught me off guard. I didn't know how to respond to it. Well, I mean, you have more experience than me. I was wondering what you thought, I said. The trees around us rustled in the slay mountain breeze, the air smelling sweet and clean. I looked past Agent Hudson and could see for dozens of miles into the North Korean countryside. Quaint small villages dotted the landscape, with dirt roads sneaking their way through the thick trees. Far off in the distance from the direction of the watchtower, we heard yelling in from a different direction. Dogs had started barking. Oh crap, Agent Hudson said. Let's pick up the pace. They have tracking dogs, I think. I don't know if they'll pick up our scent and follow us or whether they'll catch the trail of whoever actually did that horrible crap. Skinning that man alive and all that. But our trail is fresh, so I'm not liking our odds. He began to speed walk pulling out the electric compass and reading it as he went. From our view high up on the mountain, I could see a little town not far away. Agent Hudson did too, and he quickly pocketed the electric compass. Okay, I know where we are, he said. I don't need that anymore. So, are you going to answer my question? I asked. He walked fast beside me, breathing hard, a slight sheen of perspiration showing on his face. I don't have an answer for you, Jintao, he said calmly. Do I think I know everything strange and unusual that we'll encounter just because I've been in this job for a few years? But no, I don't think that's what's going on. I've never seen anything like that before and I hope for both our sakes that we we'll never see it again. What do you think about what Al said? About biological and chemical weapons, I said. Do you think maybe they tested out some new agent and it got out? I think the most likely answer is that the man we saw wasn't actually dead. He might have looked dead when we first got there, but I've seen lots of people who looked dead and weren't. Even being skinned alive, you can live for a while. Maybe he was in a stupor or a catatonic state from all the pain and shock that he must have suffered. Maybe they gave that soldier some drug or chemical agent so he wouldn't feel pain. But it's not like we saw Lazarus rising out of the grave. In my book, all we saw was a dying, crazed man nailed to the wall. He stopped speaking. The dog sounding much closer now. We had almost made it to the village. It looked fairly empty, though. I saw a feral-looking, extremely skinny cat skulking around a nearby residence. As we entered the town, I realized just how dilapidated and shoddy the small houses and huts here looked. The one on the edge of the forest with the cat in the yard literally had holes in the roof, and the windows were broken and covered over with paper. No power lines ran to any of the houses. 
I thought to myself how cold and miserable the winters must be here, without electricity or central heating. As if on cue, an old woman came hobbling out of the house, stooping down to pet the cat. She looked tiny, no more than five feet, and had an old-fashioned red satin dress covering her thin and shaking frame. She looked up at us with bleary eyes, the whites looking like yellow jelly. She had a hunched back look and took small, tottering steps as she leaned heavily on her wooden cane. After staring at us in surprise for a few long moments, she smiled, showing her few remaining teeth spread out in her mouth like lone sentries scattered across a war zone. Are you with the tour group? She asked in Korean and I immediately answered smiling. Yes, we got separated, I'm afraid, I said. She gave me a suspicious look and then she motioned for me to come inside the house. Oh, well, come in. I'll get you food and water. Maybe we can find a way to get you back to your group. That'd be wonderful, I said. Agent Hudson understood some Korean but not much. I translated the conversation for him and he grunted in assent. I'm not eating any of this dang Korean food, he said. It's probably all cats and dogs. Did you know the North Korean government put up posters all around the towns saying to eat dog meat in the summertime because it cools you down? In reality, they just wanted free food for the people and slaughtering wild dogs is one more way to give it. I followed the old woman through the battered, cracked front door of the house. Inside, I saw a home that only someone in extreme poverty could love. A dirty chipped table stood in the middle of the kitchen. A fire roared in the collapsing fireplace. Most of the bricks that composed it were either loose, fractured, or missing entirely. Above the fire, I saw a black metal pot. There was an odor of rotting wood and mold. I also smelled something strange coming from the pot, a smell almost like green tea. I walked over and looked in, inhaling it deeply. In the boiling water, I saw only grass clippings and a dead snake being cooked together for a disgusting broth. I looked up sharply at the woman who didn't seem to notice my revulsion. You eat this, I asked the old woman who smiled wanly. Oh, when we can catch snakes or rats to eat, we do, she replied. Otherwise, it's just a grass and rotten cabbage from the government, along with powdered milk sometimes or rice. But you can't count on the rations coming in. They've been cut and then cut again until we feel constantly hungry. What's your name? I asked. He Jin, she said, bowing curtly. I wondered whether this woman was a friend or a liability. I certainly didn't want to kill her and I also didn't want to risk her running out to inform the authorities of our presence immediately after we left. I could see these same thoughts passing through Agent Hudson's mind, his face turning stony as he looked down at her. I'm Jin Tao and this is Mark, I said, purposefully not giving her our full names. Have you seen anything strange around here lately? We found a corpse in the woods that appeared to be not fully dead. Her eyes widened at this and she uttered a short gasp. We had that during the arduous march, the famine that killed millions, she said. Some of the people who starved came back and they were rabid, biting, and totally insane. Nothing was left of their humanity. They were just agents of hunger who went around eating the living. And what about the line? And I looked and beheld a pale horse. Have you ever heard that before? I asked. She broke eye contact, looking down and to the left, hesitating for a long moment. Uh, no, I'm sorry, she said. In North Korea, Bibles could get you a death sentence or life in a concentration camp, so I doubted if she would have known the reference anyway but something in her demeanor suggested that she knew more than she had said. I wondered if this was just a paranoia from the stressful situation, or whether I was actually seeing it. As I relayed the conversation to Agent Hudson in full, I heard dogs barking outside and men calling orders. The heavy thud of many booted feet echoed from the dirt road through the village, and it seemed to be growing nearer by the second. Before I knew what was happening, 
I saw Agent Hudson take out his tranquilizer gun and shoot a dart into her stomach. She looked down confused and then frowned. With seconds, she began to wave around her feet. Oh, she said falling. Agent Hudson scooped her up in his arms as the knocks came from the front door, loud and insistent. Soldiers yelled in North Korean stating that enemy agents had infiltrated the area and that a search was underway. Agent Hudson ran to the bedroom throwing the woman down on the threadbare mattress. I heard crashing from the front and back of the house and heavy boots began to thud on the wooden floors. Without thinking, Agent Hudson and I took refuge in a closet in the bedroom, shutting the door quietly behind us though, leaving a slit to see outside. Then we waited for the men to come in and discover us with guns drawn and take us to the torture chamber. I heard the soldiers sweeping the house from room to room, dogs furiously barking outside. A car that sounded like its muffler had fallen off sometime during the Vietnam War idled in the street. They found the old woman laying comatose in her bed and tried unsuccessfully to rouse her, screaming orders at her over and over but with no response. I heard footsteps coming towards the door of the closet where we hid, and my finger tightened on the trigger. I was resolved to go down fighting and not be captured and given a slow death on a blood-stained concrete slab in the basement of some building where the townspeople never go. I saw Agent Hudson's eyes narrow, the scope of the gun raised to chest height as he prepared to start shooting. The air felt electric with tension, and I tried not to even breathe too loudly lest we be heard. My heart beat furiously in my ears, each thud seeming to betray my presence to the enemy. I tried to calm myself to stop the trembling that swept across my body, but then a commotion started on the street and the soldiers began issuing orders and rushing outside. Firing started and screams of agony and horror shattered the small, poverty-stricken town. I slowly opened the door expecting some sort of trap, but the shrieking and wails coming from outside could not have been staged. There was too much pain in the voice, intolerable. It sounded like their vocal cords would rupture from the effort, and then the screams were cut off one by one. I walked softly to the window, seeing He Jin still laying on the bed unconscious. I would have to give her a dose of an opioid antagonist to prevent a likely overdose that would cause her to stop breathing and turn blue. For drugs like Atorphin, we carried a preloaded red syringe that read, Revive On, for animal use only. I had wanted to laugh when I first read it, but the CIA had assured me that Atorphin was the safest and quickest method of immobilization and that this was an antidote that would work on humans as well. As I got to the window seeing the cracked glass panes and ancient splintering wood, a sudden urge to turn away came over and I began sweating heavily. Chills ran up and down my body and I felt unreal, not in the moment. It felt like I had just woken up in the middle of a dream, but when I looked outside, I knew my mind could not have conjured such atrocities in the course of a nightmare. On a white, skeletal horse sat a red rider, his body twisted and dark, his features demonic and inhuman. The hooves softly clicked on the dirt and stones as the man rode over bodies, their faces frozen in horror. It seemed like I was looking at something not from the angles and geometry of our universe, as if space itself twisted around this horrendous being of power. Its massive head formed the shape of an upside-down triangle, its crimson skin is smooth as fresh paint. Two bulbous, glistening eyes stared out straight ahead unblinking. They looked like two spherical obsidian stones, as large as baseballs and seemingly without eyelids. They looked insectoid or even entirely alien. Like the eyes of a poisonous snake, they radiated malice and power. Underneath it had some strange exoskeleton, its bones on the outside of its body, grooved and smooth like a red shell rippling down its thin chest. Its legs jutted out the sides of the undead Horus, like the legs of a praying mantis, sharp and muscular. The Horus, despite having no flesh or muscle on its body, moved quickly. It had two pure black eyes like those of its master, though not nearly as strange. They didn't form a bulbous spherical mass, like those of the riders, 
but looked like two black stones embedded into its skull, shining with oil spot rainbows and colors that glimmered off its eyes as they caught the sun. A North Korean man ran across the street and the rider on the horse pointed a long, festering finger in his direction and uttered a single word. The man stopped immediately, his eyes widening, the blood draining from his face. He began to claw at his own eyes, ripping them and shredding them, until blood streamed from the sockets and two empty lidless voids stared out. He began to choke and turn blue, as if he had swallowed his own tongue and fell to the ground, seizing and kicking. I saw his fingernails and lips becoming cyanotic as he laid on the dirt, as limp as a rag doll. As if in response, the creature on the skeletal horus gave out a deafening demonic shriek. It echoed across the mountains, reverberating in eerie waves. The voice sounded like thousands of voices spliced together, some simultaneously fading out, while others rose in a harmonizing cacophony. It made a nightmarish sound, and goosebumps rose up on my skin as I listened to the cry of this creature. A cry as alien and inhuman as anything that I had ever heard. I realized Agent Hudson was no longer standing next to me. He had the red syringe in his hand, injecting some of the Revivon into He Lin's neck. Her breathing seemed to slow, far too slow for comfort, and her face looked pale. But within seconds her breathing began to accelerate, and her eyes had started to flutter. With a confused and sleepy expression, she opened her eyes seemingly not realizing where she was or how she got there. Agent Hudson looked up, motioning for me to come over. I looked out the window. I saw countless bodies on the road, men, women, and children all laying haphazardly next to one another. The creature had stopped its incessant, demonic screaming, but the echo still came back over the mountains, slowly dying down over a few seconds. My ears rang from the intensity of it, a high-pitched buzzing that made it hard to understand Agent Hudson's words. I listened intently, looking at his lips. She knows something, he said, his eyes cold and slitted. We need to find out what's going on here. I think it's something far worse than we imagined. I heard the distant clicking of the horse's hooves as it passed on the street, trampling the dozens of corpses on the way. Oh no, I knew it. He Jin said woozily, her head spasmodically moving from side to side, her eyes wide and full of terror. She looked up at the ceiling as she lay on her ancient bed. Agent Hudson looked at me. Your Korean is far better than mine, he said. She'll trust you more than me simply because you know the language and you look like her. I shrugged. I'll give it a shot, I said. I pulled up a rickety chair, continuously glancing out the window, but the strange rider had passed by. He no longer screamed, and the silence outside seemed deathly. The smell of blood hung heavy in the air, coming through the cracks and broken windows of the dilapidated house. He Jin, I said, pulling up close to her. She moved her head on the pillow, meeting my eyes. They were wide and very dark filled with nightmarish memories and terrors that I couldn't imagine. What happened during the arduous march? What caused the bodies to come back? We don't know where it started, but it seemed to come from the forest north of here. I looked knowingly at Agent Hudson who nodded. That was where the biological weapons facility we had been sent to investigate was located. Directly north as the crow flies not more than three or four miles from the town. And what was it? I asked. The undead, but not just them. They followed something inhuman, something that rode by on a horse. I never saw it, but I had heard stories from survivors. They said that its horse had shown a pale color made of bones with pure black eyes, like those of its master. The military told us that it was a monster sent by the Americans or the South Koreans and that our great leader would respond in forests by sending a thousand monsters to their country for every one that invaded ours. But others whispered that it was made by the Democratic People's Republic itself, though they would never say it publicly for fear of execution. And how did it end? I asked. When the famine ended, the corpses and the rider went where? She shrugged. 
the Chinese sent reinforcements to the border regions, and the DPRK began to fill every town around here with soldiers. Most of the Korean soldiers were starving just like us, and they would take our food by force, whatever little we had. If anyone was caught hoarding more than a couple meals worth, they would be publicly executed. I spent that time foraging in the forest for herbs and mushrooms, and trying to capture small game, even eating rats and mice that I caught in traps. I avoided the town as much as I could after I saw the first of the dead rise to life. It seemed to last forever, but then one day the soldiers were gone, and food began to come back in slowly. We were given rice and then bread, and the arduous march came to an end, with millions of our comrades dead. It was so bad back then that you couldn't leave the bodies of your loved ones out. They had to be buried immediately after death. Otherwise, you would come back and find their bodies gone, or meat cut out from the legs and arms. Cannibalism ran rampant, and people ate grass and dirt just to fill their stomachs. But you are still eating grass, I pointed out. She smiled sadly. Only once a day now, she said, as if that made it acceptable. And in these conditions, maybe it was. I had immense respect for this old woman who had survived to such hardships and starvation, and seen such horrors unleashed. How come none of this ever got out? I asked. No one in the rest of the world knows anything about the dead rising during the famine. We know that millions of people starved, but even finding out how many was impossible. What happens here, it stays here with our people. It is our burden alone. Living here is like living in a reinforced fortress, with no one allowed to leave or communicate with anyone outside. Anyone who tries to leave is shot on sight. The police make sure you know the consequences of trying to leave, or of communicating with the outside world. They say no one should want to leave, because we're the greatest society in the world, the most equal and the most feared. No one would attack us and that's why I think maybe it came from our own people. I was about to respond when I heard the cracking of twigs and brush moving right outside of the house. Moving quietly to the window, I looked outside. The rider was gone, but now a horde of walking corpses streamed into the town. They had blood coming from their mouths, their nose, their eyes, streaming yellowish, viscous fluid out of gaping wounds that ran down their bodies. Deep gash marks, bullet wounds, or marks of torture shone out on their bodies, revealing bones and ligaments underneath. A horrific sight that sent waves of fear through my body. The smell that came with the wave felt like a solid wall of fetid rot, an odor so thick that I could taste it, and I nearly retched, like rotten cheese decomposing tomatoes and rancid meat. That smell emanated out from the hundreds of corpses that gnashed their mouths, chewing the air constantly. Their bloody eyes stared like doll's eyes, blank and lifeless in their sunken faces. Most looked starved and many were totally naked, though on some, rotting fragments of cloth still clung to their pale, lifeless skin, threadbare and clotted with blood. Yellow pus and mucus shone and glistened on their bodies as they moved forward, hungry and fearless an army that seemed to emanate from one large hive mind, coordinating their movements like birds in a flock. He Jin didn't see them, and in her partial opioid stupor, she may not have heard the subtle movements. They didn't scream or shriek unlike the rider, and they moved as silently as predators. Whatever few people still had life on the street began screaming again as their bodies were eaten alive. The corpses lunging forward at the human flesh on the street, falling upon it with powerful jaws. The screams were weak and panicked. The last calls of dying men and women as they came back to a nightmare, even worse than before. Those who died during the famine came back. Mobs of walking undead children who ate even their own parents and grandparents, though many were orphans by that point. The parents died too from starvation and their bodies were often eaten by the townspeople. Many turned to cannibalism and human meat was sold on the black market during the darkest of times. 
Women used to sell themselves just to get a bowl of rice or a piece of bread. People would eat their own children and mothers, and strangers or even friends were killed for whatever little food they had. The walking corpses turned their heads towards the house, like bloodhounds who just got a whiff of their prey. As she kept talking, they began to rise from these still bodies that they fed upon, converging upon the front door. A stream of rotting flesh and gaping mouths who now knew where we were. Agent Hudson, I said in a trembling voice, time to go. He had seen it too and we started sprinting towards the back door. He Jin didn't rise and didn't seem to realize the danger. We had to save ourselves and also had a mission to accomplish. One that seemed far too important than ever now. I had a sick feeling in my stomach as I left her behind, condemning her to a horrible and slow death. Agent Hudson smashed through the rickety boards of the back door without even opening it, splintering the wood in an explosion of adrenaline. I followed her through the hole. He Jin began to scream in agony and I quickly turned, seeing the frontmost corpses lunging forward and eating her from the legs and stomach. Her eyes rolled in pain and horror, shrieking like a banshee as blood gushed from the bites. The undead in the back of the streaming crowd stopped, looking at me while I stood in the door, an M67 fragmentation in my right hand, round and blue as a robin's egg. I pulled the pin throwing it in an overhand arc that flew past in a blur and bounced off the floor of the kitchen, rolling into the bedroom across from me. As I turned and ran, I saw Heejin's eyes, haunted, staring up at the ceiling as blood streamed from her stomach and legs. She moaned and whimpered constantly, no longer having the energy to scream. The creatures ripped the flesh off with their teeth, swallowing huge chunks of her body without chewing. It was a sickening sight and even a few months later, recalling it makes me feel sick to my stomach. Agent Hudson had reached the edge of the woods and I was now 30 feet behind him as I sprinted as fast as I could to give myself distance from the explosion that I knew was coming. I counted down in my head, five, four, three, two, but that was as far as I got. A flash of light exploded out of the house, sending splintered boards and pieces of drywall flying in all directions. I looked back and saw a red ball of fire catching the drywood of the house in an instant. My ears rang from the ground-shaking roar of the grenade. I started to look forward again, but I tripped on a rock and went flying. I landed on the grass, hitting my head hard against the dirt. It only stunned me for a few moments, but as I laid there, still too close to the house for any peace of mind, I heard a new sound coming from the house. The corpses had started to make noises, but they didn't scream. It sounded like a bloodthirsty crowd moaning in agreement as some fanatical leader whipped them into a frenzy, or the cheering of Roman spectators in a coliseum seeing men slice each other apart. It sounded like hundreds of people enraptured at chanting their death rattle, and then as the fire spread and the house quickly started to collapse on itself, it faded into silence. As we passed through the woods, following a winding deer trail up and down the mountains, my thoughts kept turning back to He Jin and what she had said. What do you think about all this? I asked him, and he looked over at me with an icy glance. Our mission doesn't require us to think about any of this, he said. We're just gathering information and reporting back. Thank God we came when we did. Hopefully it's still early enough in the process to undo some of the damage. What process? I asked. He hesitated for a long moment and then started talking, looking straight ahead and not making eye contact. The North Koreans aren't the only ones to make this breakthrough, he said. Scientists in the US and Russia have also experimented with genetically engineered viruses or synthetic prions that can interact with dying tissue. At the expense of higher cognitive functioning, some of these viruses can keep the body alive or even bring it back from the dead. In our experiments, the test subjects always end up like the people here. Only the lower parts of the brain still function, those related to hunger and instinctual needs. They seem to feel no pain, and they have no memories or concept of self, as far as we can tell. But that's not the strangest part. 
When our scientists injected a group of recently deceased corpses, the group seemed to be able to communicate somehow, as if without words. Unlike birds in a flock, I asked, remembering my thoughts when I saw the silent river of bodies flowing into the town. He nodded grimly. Uh, somewhat, uh, but this is more complex. We understand flock movement, it's simple science. Each bird keeps a certain gap between itself and every other bird, and so any movement on the fringes causes the entire group to move, as if of one mind but in reality. They're all just responded instinctually to the desire to put a predetermined space between themselves and the other birds nearby. All these individuals moving in this way causes a seemingly disparate group of animals to form one collective action, though this is in no way telepathic or unexplainable. But these undead... He shook his head slowly, walking forward with determined steps, his heavy boots crushing the earth underneath. It's something more, it isn't just instinct. It's like they can communicate without any external signal. I'll give you an example. We had two in barred prison cells in the same hall. Every meal, one of our men would come by and give them raw meat, which they would greedily eat as soon as it was thrown. But something went wrong. The two reanimated corpses couldn't possibly see each other and they never talk, well not in words anyway. Sometimes they make noises when they're dying or being attacked like we heard back there. And it's always the same sounds. Never a scream or a cry of pain but that strange and drawn out. Ah, goofy I know. I nodded. I've heard some other things before, I said. I remember listening to a speech about the final solution. As he advocated murder and extermination, the crowd began clapping and admitted that same, ah, it was bloodthirsty, like a combination of bloodlust and adrenaline, of extreme pleasure and the promise of future death for the enemy. But why do they do it when they die? He shrugged. Uh, no one knows. Maybe we'll figure it out one day, but it's just one more unexplained part of their mob behavior. Anyways, one of the guards at the time was a good friend of mine. I had actually gotten him a job from the company. He was in the Rangers with me for a couple years. He was strong, smart, and had amazing reflexes. A true veteran of a soldier. And yet in the end, none of that helped him. The other guard was giving the meat to the undead. He broke the protocol by reaching through the bars and dropping it. The corpse was, so he sat across the room but in a blur. It lunged at him and grabbed his hand. He began screaming as it bit his fingers off, holding his wrist in a death grip. My friend turned to look, standing next to the bars, and the other creature who had been prone in the corner and appeared totally blank, almost hibernating, suddenly appeared and reached through the bars. My friend had his back to the cage only for a second, while he turned around and looked at the source of the screaming. But it was enough. Zombie grabbed him by the soldiers, forcing him back into the bars with its superhuman strength. This man was a beast and he worked out every day, but he couldn't release himself from the grip of the smaller emaciated undead creature. Happened so quickly that no one even realized they were attacking until it was over. Undead man slammed my friend's head into the bars over and over, gripping him by the neck from behind. My friend lost consciousness so quickly his body going limp, but the creature kept slamming the back of his skull into the metal until it had broke in multiple spots. He ended up going into a coma and dying a few days later without ever waking up. When the SWAT team came in to deal with the attack, they found the undead creature licking the blood and hair and bone fragments off the dirty metal bars, as blank and as quiet as ever. But that blankness is a front, it's all a lie. They're much smarter than you might think. We walked in silence for a while. I admired the beautiful mountain views. It seemed to such a contrast to the horrors nearby. Few people who visited the area would ever believe that a biological weapons laboratory dealing in human experimentation was hid nearby. Moreover, we had been warned before we left that the North Koreans may have secret camps in the area to use prisoners as labor and keep the human guinea pigs close to the laboratory. 
so they could be slaughtered and experimented upon easily and at once. Seeing as the company had access to high-tech spy satellites that could see a dumpster from outer space, I figured this warning was a guarantee that we would see concentration camps as well. Finally, I saw a break in the trees. The sun had started to go down behind the mountains and a cool breeze began to blow through the area. The sweat on my forehead from hiking so far evaporated quickly, and I started to feel relief that we had actually reached our destination. Now we could finish this horrible task and go home. But a chill ran through my body as I peered through the trees at the building. From here I could see the metal door in the front of the complex stood wide open. Across the front wall written in Korean and the same huge black writing as before appeared only three words. Come and see. We argued for a few minutes. I did not want to go in. It's clearly a trap, I said. Why is the door wide open? They know we're here and they want us to go in so that they can ambush us and capture us. It couldn't be more obvious. But Agent Hudson wasn't so sure. He thought that the words had nothing to do with us and that the door may have been left open by fleeing people. Our mission, he said, is to go in and find out what's going on. We have no choice. If it's a trap, don't get taken alive. But with the amount of chaos in this area right now, we will never have a better chance than we do at this moment. We need to take it. I sighed. Stay close behind me and cover our backs. Now let's go. By the time that we broke out of the woods, moving silently with guns raised, darkness had descended. The biological weapons laboratory still had electricity and bright lights shone from all around it. We first had to move through a razor wire fence on the outer perimeter of the complex. It had a guardhouse situated at the only gate. I noticed that this road was paved unlike all the others that I had seen and it looked fairly new. The North Koreans apparently had plenty of money to spend on the military, but none to spend on their own people or residential infrastructure. I could see the entire complex much more clearly now. I passed by the guardhouse close behind Agent Hudson, glancing inside as I went. I saw a dead man in there, his face eaten off. His skull gleamed white behind the red, like a macabre Christmas decoration. The complex itself looked massive, I couldn't see the end of it. Constructed of grey, smooth concrete with a flat roof and no windows, it came across as one of the most depressing and utilitarian architectures that I had ever beheld. It rose four stories in the air but we knew from informants that it also descended another five. What we wanted was down below, as the upper stories were mainly used for bureaucracy and paperwork. The actual experiments and pathogens were kept below, and the deeper one descended, the more virulent and dangerous the pathogens became. Between the fence and the complex, a field extended around the square building, the paved road winding its way through the neatly trimmed grass. Without hesitation, we sprinted through the open area. I kept checking our backs, but despite the feeling of eyes watching me, I saw no sign of anyone. Soon we were inside the complex. The breeze came in with us, but no longer did the smell of pure mountain air and forest surround us. A fetid odor, rotten and thick, permeated the entire complex. I looked down the hallway seeing portraits of previous leaders as well as various propaganda posters, many of them showing nuclear missiles and ICBMs. We will incinerate all our enemies in a sea of fire. One poster to my right exclaimed, a North Korean soldier's face painted in front of a soaring nuclear missile, a wall of fire and smoke in the background. Agent Hudson and I stopped to rest for a moment in this strange milieu of totalitarianism and nationalism. North Korea had always reminded me of a modern real world in 1984. We have to go to the bottom floor, Agent Hudson said, breathing heavily. I nodded already knowing that. He had a tendency to repeat information in tense situations. I always assumed it somehow relieved his anxiety. That crippling, heart-tightening feeling before a battle of a life or death situation. Lead the way, I said, smiling at him, trying to relieve the tension. 
We found a stairway and began descending. The smell of rotting bodies grew worse, the air growing thicker as we descended. No longer did the sweet mountain breeze blow around us. I coughed, almost throwing up and bending double. Agent Hudson whipped around, putting his fingers to his lips and his eyes blazing. By the time that we got to the bottom floor, I was breathing through my mouth, my eyes watering. I wish that they had given us some gas masks or respirators. I couldn't imagine how anybody could work here, though I also couldn't imagine eating grass and rats on a daily basis. Agent Hudson silently pushed the door open, disappearing into the dark corridor with his rifle ready. I followed closely behind. I found a long, dimly lit hallway. Down here, there were no propaganda posters, no portraits of the great leader. It felt cold and blank. Concrete walls opened into rooms without doors. We moved into the first room, and I nearly vomited at what I saw. A man tied down to a stretcher and gagged. He had been dissected alive without anesthesia. He moved his head wildly, his gleaming eyes staring back at us in horror. I saw his entire chest and stomach open. I could see the thready, rapid heart beating in the open surgical wound. The ribs had been removed and placed neatly in a pile beside the man. Without hesitation, I stepped forward, raising my tranquilizer gun and shot him in the arm. It would be a fatal dose, a rapid cessation of breathing without any revivon to counteract the lethal opioid, as the itorphin was nearly a hundred times stronger than fentanyl. Turning around rapidly, we left the room, moving along this corridor of nightmares. In the next room, we found a woman's corpse, with massive bubonic sores all over her body. Viscous yellow fluid ran out of the wounds. They concentrated along the locations of her lymph nodes, with pustules the size of oranges, swelling out of her neck and armpits. That looks like the Black Death, Agent Hudson said. Oh, we should probably get out of here, this isn't helping, and I don't want to be near that crap. Can't believe they don't even contain highly infectious biological agents in plexiglass or something here, like we do back in the States. These people probably make a thousand dollars a year, I reminded him. This is one of the poorest countries imaginable. Heck, I'm surprised they can even keep a constant flow of electricity to this building. We kept moving and to my surprise, the next room was in some den of horror. It was an office. It looked like the office of a doctor or a scientist, with posters of the human body covering the walls. In the corner, I saw a man cowering behind his desk, dressed in a white lab coat. He was skinny, with black framed glasses. I looked over his face, high cheekbones and small chin. It didn't look like the face of a devil. Agent Hudson and I stared in surprise at him for a fraction of a second. He used the opportunity to raise a pistol, and before I knew it, he had fired. No, I cried instinctively, raising my gun and shooting him in the chest. I turned to see Agent Hudson on the ground. I ran towards the scientist who now laid on the floor, a puddle of blood spreading underneath his body and soaking into his white coat. I took the gun away from him and then ran back to Agent Hudson. I saw with immense relief that the bullet had hit him in his Kevlar body armor, directly above the navel. It would probably leave a deep and painful bruise, but it wouldn't kill him. He grunted, a sweaty now. Dang, that hurts, he said through gritted teeth, breathing fast. I left him on the ground and went back to the scientist. He was still alive. The bullet appeared to have hit him in his left shoulder. It bled heavily, but it didn't appear to have torn any arteries or major blood vessels. I knelt down next to him, putting my gloved right hand on the wound and pressing down. He screamed in pain. Yeah, it hurts, doesn't it? I said. So I want to play a game with you. If you give me the right answers, I'll let you live. And if I think you're lying to me, well... I took one finger and reached into the wound pressing hard against these shattered bone fragments, feeling the warm blood running down around my gloved finger. He nearly passed out, his face turning pale, but he came back to consciousness, shrieking and waving his arms. 
I took my finger out, flicking the blood off with a smile. Okay, so what's your name? Dr. Lee, he said. Okay, Lee. And what do you do here? I'm the head scientist for the research program here. And are you the one responsible for all the walking corpses nearby? I asked. He hesitated for a long moment. I sighed, bringing my fist back and punching him in the nose hard. I felt it crack under the blow, his head slamming back into the concrete floor. He began to plead and cry. Please, he said, blood streaming out of his nose. Don't hurt me anymore, I'll tell, I'll tell you. Agent Hudson had by this point got in shakily to his feet and walked over towards us. He leaned heavily on the desk, looking down at Dr. Lee with hatred. Yes, I was in charge of the resurrection virus. We had obtained a sample from Russia gathered by bribing one of the head scientists in the project, but I have no idea how it escaped from the lab. We had only given it to a few subjects here. And those subjects are all still here, I asked. He nodded his face a bloody mess, his nose crooked and smashed. What about the rider on the skeletal horse? He looked at me in confusion and genuine expression as far as I could tell. The what? He asked. You don't know anything about some monster with bulging black eyes who rides around on a horse made of bones, I asked. He looked at me like I was insane, and I figured that was answer enough. I looked at Agent Hudson. What do you want to do with this one? I asked. We should in reality take him as hostage. He likely has a lot of vital information. Shaking his head, Agent Hudson pulled his pistol out of its holster. Nah, there's too much danger in our escape route, he said, and we aren't counting on zombies when we made them. So change of plans, no hostages. He aimed his pistol directly at the center of Dr. Lee's face. But we were so intent on our work that neither of us noticed the undead who had entered the room. Dr. Lee's eyes widened, but not at the sight of Agent Hudson's pistol. He looked behind him, beginning to whimper and plead. I spun around, seeing a small girl missing an arm. It looked surgically amputated at the soldier, and the wound still had a yellowish pus and watery blood leaking out. Her eyes, though, were not those of a little girl. They looked like glass eyes, as lifeless as a statue's. Though this mission took place a few months ago, those eyes still haunt me, and in my nightmares, I still see them daily. With a vicious, rapid expression on her face, she sprinted forward, a blur of bloody skin and fluttering white hospital gown. Jumping onto Agent Hudson's back, she began to bite furiously at his neck. He spun around in circles trying to throw her off and screaming for help. I ran forward, but another body tackled me from the side, throwing me over the desk. As my shoulder smashed into the wood, my rifle went flying out of my hands. I landed on the chair, crushing it beneath my body, feeling the wood splintering cut into my exposed skin. Rising quickly, I reached for my pistol, looking across the desk at the blank eyes of the man standing there, a bullet hole in the direct center of his chest. I saw marks of the black death on his body as well. Swollen lymph nodes turned black and purple. Fluid-filled pustules the size of eggs rising on his skin. I shot him in the brain and he went down, kicking and writhing. Agent Hudson had by now thrown the girl off and whipped his pistol around, shooting her in the face. Blood streamed down his neck from deep cuts where large parts of the skin had been bitten off. Oh Jesus, he said wincing. That hurts. We need bandages, I said. Dr. Lee sat up. We have medical supplies in my desk, he said pointing at the drawer. I quickly got out disinfectant and bandages, attending to Agent Hudson's wound. He breathed quickly but showed no signs of pain as I cleaned and wrapped it. You're going to need my help to make it out of here, Dr. Lee said. There's too many of those things. If you agree not to kill me, I'll help you, and I'll give you whatever information you need. As if on cue, I heard doors slamming from the floors above us, echoing down the stairway. More of them are rising, and the camp nearby is thousands of bodies. If you don't take my help, you'll be overwhelmed. There are secret passages nearby. We quickly agreed to take Dr. Lee with us. 
Grabbing a medical kit, we got a mop. I recovered my rifle and pointed it at the back of his head. Lead the way. I said as dozens of footsteps began descending the stairs. I was hesitant to take Dr. Lee with us at all. I knew if I had been captured, he wouldn't have hesitated for a millisecond to dissect me alive or use me as a guinea pig for some excruciating experiment. But he turned out to be more useful than I ever imagined. He sprinted down the long, concrete hallway, leaving drops of blood from his streaming nose as he we went. Agent Hudson and I followed him side by side, both of us checking our bags constantly. The footsteps grew louder and closer by the second, and at any moment, I expected to see dozens of hostiles streaming through the door. And Dr. Lee turned suddenly into a random side room on the right. It looked no different from the other biological laboratories, except this one had no research subject strapped to the cold table. Dried blood saturated the surface and the floor all around it. I thought to myself what a health code violation that was, and then I realized with some slight amusement that this country had probably never heard of a health code. The door slammed loudly open at the end of the hallway, but I heard no men shouting orders, and no dogs barking, and no sound of normal human interaction. A cold chill ran down my spine as the soft padding of sprinting footsteps came closer and closer to the room. Dr. Lee frantically ran to the corner, leaving small random drops of blood dripping down from his wounds. I wondered whether the undead could smell the blood, whether they would follow the scent directly to us in a matter of moments. Dr. Lee fumbled with a hatchway in the corner. He pulled it open with a loud shrieking of metal. The small metal door was covered in rust, and it looked like it hadn't been opened since the Korean War. The sound of the groaning metal echoed down the hallway. So much adrenaline rushed through my body at that moment. I felt as if I could see every sound wave passing through the air. Time seemed to slow down as the first twisting, limping silhouettes came across the threshold. Without thinking, I pushed Dr. Lee hard into the hatchway, hearing him fall down the tunnel. I had no idea how far down it was, and at this point, I didn't care. I saw the open, black mouths of the undead approaching me. At the front, I saw a little Korean boy, no older than seven or eight, limping forwards with a swollen body. It looked like he had died of starvation, his stomach bulging over his naked sticks of legs one foot dragging behind him, crooked and swollen. Red as streamed down his blank eyes from a deep slash in his skull. I could see the bone peeking out through the wound, like the moon shining out from behind the clouds. As lithe as a dancer twisting their bodies in inhuman ways, some dragging shattered legs behind them, this mass of rotting humanity came at us. Agent Hudson went into the tunnel next, giving me a quick glance before he dropped down. I pulled out an M67 fragmentation grenade from my suit, yanking the pin out quickly and rolling the grenade across the room, and then I dropped down. The fall was longer than I expected and I did embrace myself at all for it, landing heavily on my right ankle. I felt a twist, an explosion of pain running up through my leg. Then the rest of my body fell forwards and I landed hard on Agent Hudson. He grunted, Jesus he began to say, and then the grenade went off. All I remember was thinking that the world was collapsing around me, that the sun had gone supernova and blown apart the entire planet, but within moments, as heavy clouds of earth and stone fell from the ceiling, I felt something smash into the back of my head. My vision went white for a moment, warm blood streaming down my back, and then I was gone. Hey, can you hear me? A voice asked from far away. I saw darkness, felt something sticking on my torso and head. I groaned, not moving or responding for a few seconds. Can you stand? My vision started to return. I remembered what had happened and then sat up quickly, causing a lightning bolt of pain to sear through my head. I gritted my teeth, pressing both hands against the side of my skull, as if I could keep the pain contained with simple pressure. God dang, I whispered. That really hurts. I saw Agent Hudson kneeling next to me in the dim light. Looking over, I saw Dr. Lee, sitting calmly next to me, his eyes revealing nothing. He might have been watching an infomercial on late night TV for all the expression showing on his face. Here, Agent Hudson said, reaching into his pocket. 
He pulled out a couple of tablets, pre-sealed in foil. It's naproxen. A leave. It ain't great, but it's the best we have. Unless you want to try some of the itorphan. I smiled wildly at his joke and then unwrapped both capsules. Agent Hudson held out a flask that he had pulled out of nowhere like a magic trick. He pressed the warm metal of it against my palm. It's a little early to start drinking, I muttered, my head splitting into a horrible migraine. Nah, it's Gatorade, he said. I just used the flask because it's small and it's metal, so maybe hey, it'll stop a bullet one day. Can you imagine this thin pathetic thing saving someone's life? I took a sip, handing it back to Agent Hudson. He didn't offer Dr. Lee any. In fact, he acted like the mad scientist didn't even exist. Groggily, I rose to my feet. Waves of nausea ran through my stomach and I grabbed my head again with my hands, massaging the scalp to try and help the migraine. I felt a deep gash on the back of my head and clotted sticky blood had dripped down beneath my camouflage uniform. I looked at Agent Hudson and Dr. Lee. They seemed mostly fine, though they had cuts and scrapes all over their bodies. A thin covering of dirt and dust had settled on their faces, even covering Dr. Lee's thick, black-framed glasses. He took them off and tried to clean them on the inside of his shirt. Okay, Dr. Lee, Agent Hudson said in an icy tone, using his limited grasp of Korean to communicate. This is your rodeo now. Lead the way. Dr. Lee did, rising quickly. His nose mashed to one side, his face covered in drying blood. He looked nothing at all like the professional clean doctor that we had found in the lab. So, why were you hiding? At first, Dr. Lee said nothing. He seemed to ignore the question. And then in a monotone voice, looking straight ahead down the dark and cramped tunnel, he answered, starting to walk forwards at a quick pace. We followed closely behind. I haven't been entirely truthful with you, he said. No kidding, I asked, my voice seething with sarcasm. Agent Hudson gave me a nasty look and then he motioned for Dr. Lee to continue. The last time this happened was during the arduous march. Someone released the resurrection virus then too. I don't know who or why. We'll probably never figure it out. But this time, I think I know who did it. Or at least I can narrow it down to a few people. There's a group within the weapons complex who wants to overthrow the leader by any means necessary. They hope to destabilize the country leading to a revolution. These are the only people who I believe have the motive and opportunity. A few work on the same level of the building as me, dealing with level 4 and 5 bioweapons agents. They've tried recruiting me on multiple occasions. I refused out of concern for my own life, but neither did I report them. They have connections allegedly all the way up to the leader's own sister, who was sending out feelers for what would happen if she had her brother killed and took the position upon herself. From what I know, she ultimately decided not to pursue that possibility at the moment. However, if an epidemic started in the country and led to millions of deaths, if people started dying in gruesome ways and rising from the dead, this could shock the people into action. Government has its own kind of inertia in a way. It takes another powerful force to interrupt its forward march into the future. But any force that can make the population rise up is sufficient to lead to the destruction of the state. The dirt tunnel started to turn sharply to the right and at the end, I could see dim light coming in. As we got closer, I looked up, seeing an opening with a rickety ladder that let the moonlight stream in. That hatch shouldn't be open, Dr. Lee said frowning. He began to climb up the ladder rapidly. Agent Hudson followed quickly behind him, his pistol in one hand. He had it aimed at Dr. Lee in case he tried to run or trick us in some way. For all we knew, we could have assassins or snipers waiting for us to emerge from the hatchway above our heads, but I heard no movement. I followed up the ladder behind Agent Hudson, gripping my pistol in one hand as I slung the rifle over my back. I wanted to be able to fire at the first moment if necessary. Cold fingers seemed to tickle my back, goosebumps rising all over my skin. I knew something major was close and I didn't want to reach that cataclysmic moment. I felt like a sleepwalker striding blithely over the edge of a cliff. But even though I could see it coming, 
I felt unable to change my fate in any way. What I saw when I crossed over the last rung and entered into the dark world above stopped my breath. Hundreds of North Korean soldiers' corpses littered the field that we found ourselves on. Most of their bodies burnt beyond recognition. Most still have their mouths open in silent screams, their blackened skin cracked and broken from the immense heat. Their uniforms had been burned off, or in some cases, fused into their melted skin. What happened here? I asked, a note of horror in my voice. Neither Agent Hudson nor Dr. Lee answered. They looked around with wide eyes, and as if in answer to my question, I heard the shrieking of the rider from the edge of the woods nearby. He came galloping towards us in a blur, his skeletal horse shining white under the light of the moon. The hooves of the beast crushed the burnt bodies underfoot as it ran, the bulging black eyes of the rider staring straight through us, unblinking. His mouth hung open, showing a huge void. The air around it seemed to ripple as the eerie, ear-splitting scream emanated from his alien body, rising and falling in waves, echoing through the trees and spreading over the mountains. At that moment, I could barely hear orders being shouted in Korean and reinforcements began to arrive, rushing through the trees that surrounded us and emerging into the field. They barely looked at us, focusing all their attention on the rider and his horse. They began to fire rapidly and I pulled Agent Hudson and Dr. Lee towards an opening that I saw in the human wave attack. Bullets whizzed overhead and past my ears, all aimed at the shrieking rider. One North Korean soldier ran past the others, throwing a grenade at the monster. The creature went quiet all at once, as if shocked at this brazen move. The horse rode right over the grenade and a second later it exploded. Agent Hudson, Dr. Lee and I reached the edge of the woods by this point, and I tackled Dr. Lee, instinctively pushing him and myself down. Next to us, Agent Hudson lunged, covering his head with his hands. Shrapnel and splinters of wood flew past us, a pillar of red flame rising up in the center of the field, obliterating the burnt corpses that littered the ground like leaves in an autumn forest. But when I looked back into the field, I saw the riders still approaching, totally unharmed by the bullets in the explosion. He jumped off his horse as the soldiers closed in around him, hovering in the air a few inches above the ground. He began to spin around, shrieking his inhuman cry again, and white light poured from his body as thin as a razor. Four streams of blinding energy shot out of his chest as he levitated in the air, rotating slowly in circles. The streams of deadly light hit the bodies of the soldiers that ran forward around him, firing their guns and yelling orders. As soon as the pulsating currents of light hit them, they immediately went quiet, their eyes widening, their mouths open. After it had passed, their bodies would slide apart, cut in half of the chest as if by a laser. In horror, I saw the flesh of their bodies begin to burn and melt, ripping apart as the light cut through the skin. Within seconds, every person standing in the field was dead, their destroyed bodies falling on those of their comrades underneath. The screams of the rider faded away as he lowered himself back to the ground, his sharp legs digging through the corpses of men underfoot and into the dirt beneath. From the opposite side of the field, I saw fresh reinforcements streaming in, some nearly tripping on the thousands of bodies that now littered in nearly every square inch of the field, sometimes two or three deep. But the rider paid them no heed, walking back over to his horse and mounting it with an alien grace. He started to ride towards us, the North Korean soldiers yelling orders at him and opening fire. However, it ended as quickly as it had started. When thousands of undead began to rush in from the surrounding forests, the mass of rotting flesh overtaking them, like a stream rolling over a pebble. Go! I whisper screamed at Dr. Lee and Agent Hudson. Dr. Lee was directly in front of me and I put my pistol directly into the back of his head. And if you try anything, I swear to God, I'll blow your brains out before you even know what hit you. I'm not in the mood to be messed with, you got it? He nodded, his eyes gleaming under his thick glasses. He turned away from me and started going at a jog, staying close behind Agent Hudson. Once we had given some distance between ourselves and the field, I turned, seeing no sign of the rider. Agent Hudson pulled out his electronic compass, sighing when he saw the coordinates. 
He pulled out a satellite phone from his pocket and dialed a long string of digits. After a few seconds, he said, We're about 15 minutes out from the extraction point. One in tow. Level 5 situation is in progress near the border. We need immediate backup. Without waiting for a response, he hit the end button and shoved it back into his pocket. He looked back at Dr. Lee with pure and utter hatred. You know, he said as we began jogging through the woods, going up and down mountain trails and around huge rocks and ancient trees. My grandfather was in the Korean War, Ray Hudson. He was captured and tortured by scumbags like this guy. He pointed a trembling finger at Dr. Lee. Agent Hudson did not look good. Even under the dim light of the moon and stars, I could see his neck wound had turned a sickly purplish color. He pulled out his pistol and put it to Dr. Lee's head, still shaking with anger, or maybe something else. I'll kill you right now, I swear to God. Give me one reason not to. I'll scatter your brains all over the place. You understand me. Dr. Lee nodded, his eyes wide with terror. Agent Hudson, I said sharply. What in God's name are you doing? Lower your weapon, this hostage is valuable. But he kept shaking, his finger tightening on the trigger. I braced myself for the shot, for the back of Dr. Lee's head to dissolve in a spatter of blood and bone fragments. But at the last moment, Agent Hudson holstered his pistol. He slung his rifle back around and motioned with it for us to keep going. I wondered what I had just seen. He seemed like he was losing control in some pivotal way, but he was also my superior. This was only my first mission, and who was I to tell an experienced agent how to do his job? But it still felt wrong. Finally, we saw the watchtowers in the distance, poking up above the trees as they went in a line all the way up and down the looming mountains. From here, I could see for miles. In the Chinese direction, I saw countless lights from cars, houses, and businesses. But when I looked over to the North Korean side, I saw only darkness stretching for as far as the eye could see. And just up here, Agent Hudson said, pointing to the other side of the guard tower. I saw barbed wire stretching across our path, tightened around the trees and pulled taut to mark the border. I could easily cut it with the clippers on my belt. But as I walked up to it, checking to my left and right, a swarm of activity started behind us. Leaves rustled and twigs cracked as many feet trampled the ground. Through the trees, I saw dozens of North Korean soldiers emerge, pointing their guns at us and shouting orders. And Dr. Lee put his hand straight up in the air. Please, these men kidnapped me, he screamed. I think they're agents of the Imperial American government. Help me. I saw my life flash before my eyes. I didn't know whether to put my hands up or to go out fighting. Turning, I saw Agent Hudson put his hands up his rifle falling limply from the strap around his neck. He winked at me. Following his lead, I dropped my rifle and put my hands up as well. The North Korean men running forward in their brownish-gray uniforms pulled out handcuffs to arrest us. And then sniper fire rang all around us. I ducked to the ground, covering my head as the face of the nearest soldier exploded. The others quickly followed, their chests and heads disintegrating under the impact of the hail of bullets and soon it was silent again. I took my hands off my head, raising it slowly, seeing the still bodies of all the soldiers laying sprawled on the dirt. I looked across the border and saw Agent Stryker walking forwards in his immaculately pressed black suit, surrounded by a team of men in camouflage. They snipped through the barbed wire in seconds and approached us. Nearby, I heard helicopters descending. I looked over and saw Dr. Lee still alive, looking shell-shocked and confused. Agent Stryker told him in Korean to put his hands behind his back, and they handcuffed him there on the spot, pushing him towards one of the helicopters. Agent Hudson and I followed wordlessly behind, crossing over the border. I saw men climbing down from the trees in ghillie suits, sniper rifles slung around their necks. Wordlessly, we began to enter the black helicopters that landed. Agent Stryker sat in the one that we entered, waiting. As soon as we sat down, he congratulated us on a mission well done, and especially on capturing Dr. Lee, who would provide invaluable information to his interrogators. I just felt grateful to be alive after the horrors that I had seen. 
But as we got evacuated from that place, I looked over at Agent Hudson and saw his eyes, blank and lifeless. They looked right through me as we took off, eyes like those of a statue.